How does a free blockchain work? In Bitcoin, the miners are rewarded, but in a blockchain to keep contracts, who will do the validation? Or the question can be, can a blockchain exist without miners? Um, yes, a blockchain can exist without miners. A blockchain can exist without proof of work. A blockchain can exist without uh, a game theoretical competitive consensus algorithm. Um, however, it won't be a decentralized blockchain. It will require trusted third parties, and these trusted third parties will be the ones doing the validation. Alternatively, you can consider a mechanism whereby the validation is done based on an alternative consensus algorithm, such as proof of stake. But in that case, you still have reward. Um, it's reward in the form of fees for the risk taken for validating the rules um, and the, the cost of money uh, locked up in that validation. So you either have a reward system that allows you uh, to have competition, uh, proof of stake, proof of work, and the variance of that, or you have a system without reward. Um, but in that case, the validators must be trusted. Uh, and then you introduce centralization, trusted third parties, um, and that kind of blockchain can exist, but it's not a blockchain. Um, it's a database. It's a database with digital signatures. Uh, a lot of banks are trying to do exactly that, to create a centralized database and then call it a blockchain so that it appears very innovative, even though it isn't. Larissa asks, are blocks really an advantage in the blockchain? Do the blocks that are formed in the blockchain need to exist? If every single transaction was validated by itself, wouldn't that solve the block size? Uh, problem. Wouldn't it be faster to validate just a single transaction? Is it possible to create a cryptocurrency without blocks? Uh, yes, in fact, you can. Um, in fact, many of the systems that use um, a decentralized signing algorithm instead of a proof-of-work mining algorithm don't really need blocks. Uh, blocks are needed for proof-of-work. And because um, doing the proof of work on the granularity of a single transaction essentially means um, increasing the rate at which blocks are found. So let's say you did it, uh, each transaction was its own block, it had its own proof of work and was chained to the previous transaction. Miners just selected a single transaction, calculated proof of work on it, and issued that transaction. That is perfectly possible. The problem with it is that the rate of orphaned blocks increases dramatically. So right now, you can have a fork that occurs in the chain when uh, a block is orphaned because two blocks were found more or less simultaneously within a 10-minute window. If you make that 10-minute window five minutes, the number of orphaned blocks increases quite significantly. Um, and you have to account for that in the algorithm. And there have been some attempts to shrink that uh, all the way down to about 15 seconds, which is what Ethereum does. Um, but Ethereum, in order to do that, has a special mechanism for accounting for orphan blocks um, and sharing the reward between uh, multiple winners of the proof of work, if you like. If you went all the way down to a singular transaction and you increase the throughput rate of transactions, you're now talking about doing a thousand blocks per second, each one, just one transaction. And then the problems with forking the network and synchronizing it become insurmountable. Um, the only way you can do that is if you no longer care about competition between miners, if you no longer care about proof of work, if the consensus algorithm is fundamentally different. And we see that in distributed ledger technology, where it's signing instead of mining, where the energy requirement is zero, and um, where you can now essentially uh, issue blocks as fast as you want, at which point you don't need blocks anymore. You can just chain transactions together, which is why a lot of people don't consider DLTs, distributed ledger technology, to be blockchains. They're not blockchains because they don't require blocks, and they don't require chains. Can the cost of energy be minimized by green energy? What about the economy of the whole world mining in such a case? Yes, in fact, um, green energy plays a very important role in mining because one of the characteristics of mining is that it can occur anywhere, especially now that we have uh, the ability to receive blocks by satellite. 
uh, you could pretty much do mining anywhere in the world where you have energy. Uh, and that energy can come from any source. It can come from wind, it can come from solar, it can come from hydroelectric, it can come from dirty coal, it can come from nuclear energy. Um, it can come from any of these sources. But um, energy has different properties, and the generation, uh, or actually energy doesn't, energy is fungible, but energy production facilities have different properties. For example, um, solar produces the most amount of energy during the midday uh, noon sun, and the least amount of energy at night, uh, which is zero. And often, the amount of energy that is produced does not match the amount of energy that is consumed at those times. So, in fact, the most energy that is consumed in a city is usually around 8 or 9 p.m. in the evening, um, whereas the production of solar energy is not peaking at that time, it's near zero. How do you reconcile these two mismatches? Essentially, you have energy that is being produced, that is being produced for free once you have the capacity in place, uh, the capital cost is in place, there is no operating cost for a solar energy system other than small maintenance cost. And therefore, if you're producing it in the middle of the day and nobody needs that energy, that energy is wasted. So mining can actually take that wasted energy and use it to produce income. And what that income does is it allows you to very rapidly depreciate the capital expense of building the solar plant in the first place, which means that you can take a solar plant that otherwise would be um, that would be depreciated over a period of, say, five years or ten years, and you can depreciate it over a period of one or two years, uh, which leads to an enormous investment in solar, because if you can uh, depreciate the cost of the uh, underlying capital, uh, that makes the deployment of solar much cheaper. Uh, and of course, for the miners who are mining on this energy, the cost of that energy can be much lower, um, so the profitability can be much higher. Because mining can happen anywhere, mining will happen in the places where electricity is cheapest, where the difference between capacity and demand is the greatest, where the ability to distribute the electricity by other means, such as high voltage distribution networks, exists less or doesn't exist at all. And all of those represent opportunities. In fact, that means that the greatest opportunities for mining are from sources of alternative energy, such as wind, solar, and hydroelectric, uh, geothermal even, um, because those are the sources that are remote, often from uh, populated areas, that are difficult to distribute because of the cost of distribution networks, and where there is a large mismatch between capacity and demand, uh, which means that Bitcoin is currently uh, underwriting massive investments in alternative energy around the world. John asks, while I understand that the computing power used to generate the proof of work derives value from the very fact that it secures the Bitcoin blockchain, I was wondering if there are any workable solutions for diverting that computer power for bonus value creation, tackling problems requiring big computing powers. Our predictions, uh, sorry, our applications like protein folding or finding sets of primes workable or anything else workable in this space. John, yes, in fact, there have been a number of systems that attempted to exploit the mining algorithm, the consensus algorithm, to do things that people consider useful, such as uh, protein folding or finding primes, etc. However, Bitcoin doesn't do that. Bitcoin uses an algorithm whose only use uh, is for Bitcoin, really, uh, and has no other practical use other than proving to the rest of the world that the miners have committed a certain amount of energy and therefore expenditure uh, to back the security of the network. It's essentially the promise each miner makes. Uh, here is a block. I have validated all of the transactions according to the consensus rules. I swear this under penalty of losing the energy that I have put in, and here is the proof of work demonstrating my commitment to securing and validating these transactions and obeying the consensus rules. That promise is in the form of energy consumed for the proof-of-work algorithm. Part of the problem with doing something else, something that other people might consider useful, is that that splits the reward. It means that the miners have two reasons for which they're mining. One is to secure the network, and the other is to produce protein, um, 
protein folding uh, signatures or uh, large primes. So what happens if the production of primes becomes more valuable than the Bitcoin security? Uh, what happens if there's a disruption in that network? Let's say, for example, suddenly we find a new application for, for uh, specific types of protein folding or specific types of prime numbers that make it extremely valuable to produce these numbers or these proteins. Well, the problem with that, of course, is at that point it's no longer worthwhile doing the security on the Bitcoin blockchain. Um, it's only worthwhile using that equipment to doing the protein folding, or rather, it's more worthwhile to do the secondary function than it is to do the primary function, and then Bitcoin security ceases being the primary function. At which point you can no longer trust the promise, and the promise being, I committed this energy to prove that I did the security of validating the transactions. If you can't trust that promise, then Bitcoin securities fail. Um, the, the whole idea of only doing this to secure Bitcoin uh, is that you can trust that promise. It has no other incentive. There is no other reason you would be doing this calculation other than proving your commitment to doing the security, uh, of validating the transactions correctly. And so, Bitcoin's uh, mining is useful. It's useful in proving the security of the Bitcoin network. And the more energy that is committed to proving that security, the more secure the network is, and the harder it is to attack or compromise the security of the Bitcoin network. Bitcoin's proof-of-work algorithm produces useful work. It produces the security that backs a global currency worth almost $15 billion, um, and it produces the security that ensures that that global currency cannot be attacked by any actor, however large they may be. Uh, without colluding and investing a lot of amount, uh, a lot of money in hardware and energy, and that becomes very difficult. The more energy and the more hardware that backs Bitcoin security, that is the useful application of Bitcoin's mining. And we only have one because we want that to always be the dominant use of Bitcoin's mining and never become second place to something else. Can I explain the most important differences between proof-of-work and proof-of-stake? Very simply, uh, proof-of-work requires the investment of energy which is outside of the system in the form of work. And that energy um, is a scarce resource. Energy has cost everywhere, anywhere, in any form. It has some cost. And proof-of-work forces miners to deposit that energy in the form of work and prove that they've deposited that energy by producing proof of work in order to validate and claim a probability of a reward. Proof of stake does a similar function, only instead of requiring the validators to deposit energy in the form of work, it requires them to deposit cryptocurrency within the system in the form of a stake. They basically bet cryptocurrency that gets locked up for a certain number of blocks, and they put that behind their claim to validate the rules. If everybody agrees with the validation of their rules, they remain on the majority chain, and they get a small reward back in the form of fees in return for the stake that they put in proportional to the stake that they put in. And if instead they find themselves on the wrong chain, depending on how proof of stake is implemented, they may lose some or all of their stake, or they may simply end up with their stake locked up for a while without being able to gain anything from it. 